the name of the Parsha today, the name of our section of the Torah that we read, the uh, episode of the great Torah series that we binge watch. This week is Amor, and it is a Hebrew word that means speak. Well, I sort of said that with tongue in cheek. Speak is sort of the shorthand English rendition that we would like to throw to it. But let me explain to you a little bit about what speak or emor means in the Hebrew mind, to the Hebrew thought. And the creator of the universe designed communication through Hebrew, and men have uh, taken other languages and, and tried to adapt. But here's the Hebrew, the Hebrew essence of the word emor and what it means. It's a verb. And as we said, uh, speak. But let me, let me just picture this. If you would, I'll give you an allegory. There are, I will warn you, <laughs> there are some imperfections and some tongue-in-cheek aspects to this, to this allegory. But, but let's proceed nevertheless. Walk with me along this pathway of holiness that the Holy One has designed for us today. Let's imagine that we are taking a, a stroll on this beautiful Sabbath day. Uh, on the hills, uh, up, a, up a hill side, and in, in the country, we're scent, smelling the scent of the spring air here in the northern uh, half of the world. Uh, and I, I realize you in the southern hemisphere are smelling the, the scent of fall and maybe oncoming winter. But we are, we're coming over the hill, and, and the, the wind is blowing, and it's a beautiful day. The sun is shining. The birds are singing all the wonderful things that happen as creation begins to sing its song of love to you. We will come over the hill, and I look on one side of the hill, down in the valley on the one side, and you're looking in the valley on the other side. And I'm just using you and I as two alternative persons. It's not to suggest that I would see one thing and you'd see another thing. <laughs> it's just that we are different people and we're seeing different things. To my right, to what I see in the valley, is a herd of majestic wild horses. Beautiful, stunning in their color and coloration and strong and, and free and, and, and beautiful, filling the valley and, and you're rejoicing in, in the created order in which they live in and, and just majestic creatures, stunning and I'm inspired to, to look at them and I catch my breath and just looking at them. On the other hand, on your, your, I look at you and I realize you're not seeing the wild horses. You're not seeing the, the stallions and the mares. You're not seeing the colts. You're not seeing these beautiful animals that I'm seeing on your side of the, of the valley, the mountain, the valley down below you, the, what you're seeing. You're seeing a herd of, of wild swine, wild hogs, razorbacks, as, as some of those folks in Arkansas would call. These are hogs, and you're seeing herds of these wild hogs on your side down there. And you're sort of stunned by the power, the strength of these things. They're, they're ripping up the ground. They're, snoot, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're rooting in the ground. They're, they're digging holes. They're destroying everything they touch. Wherever they go, they leave destruction. Uh, the ground is, uh, is uneven and rough. The, uh, the, everything's dead. They, they kill everything they touch. They destroy it. They eat it. They, they, they do horrible things to their own bodily fluids and waste and, and they're rolling in it and mulling in it and, and I'm over here and st stunned by the majestic beauty of these creatures, these elegant, majestic things that are, are so in tune with the created realm in which they're in and I'm looking over here and here are these wild hogs uh, and you're looking at it and, 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 and it's like both of us then decide that we're going to go down in our valley and I am going to, I've looked at those horses, I watch each one of them, I pick out one I want for my own. I want, I want to tame it, I want to take it, I want to, I want to touch it, I want to, I want to take it back to my home. I want it to live with me in my, in my home. I want to set up a, a corral for it and, and a home for it. And I, want to, I want to make it a part of my life. I want, to, I want to teach, I want to break it in a sense that I want to ride it. I want to make it now a part of my identity. I'm the one on that horse. And that's, I see this vision and I want to go down and I, and I'm doing that. On the other hand, you know, all you see is the hogs. And so what you're seeing, and I'm just, it could be me as well. It could be any person. But all we see is the hog. And we say, well, you know, I wonder if I could tame one of those rascals. I wonder if I could catch one. <laughs> I wonder if I could take one home to my house. 
and let it, let it live in my house and, and become known as, because, you know, they carry a scent with them and they carry, a, they carry a stuff with them. And, and, and that, may, that may be known as the person of, of the hog. And so I go down and I, and I with, with respect and with honor, I, 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 I catch one of these wild horses and I take it back to my home. And it, I learned to ride it, and, and we become identified one with each other. And you take your hog, and you bring the hog back to your home. And you set up a place right outside your house for it. And it does what hogs do. <laughs> and, it, and it smells to high heaven or high wherever, <laughs> other places it might smell to. And, and you identify with this hog. And everyone says, oh, yeah, I know Bill. He's, he's the hog guy. He's the guy who smells like a hog. He, he has the hog. He has the wild hog. He, he, he deals, he traffics in wild hogs. And I know the other guy, and he traffics in majestic horses. Okay, so I'm giving you these two pictures, these, these illustrations. This allegory is out there for you, for you to decide. Now, let me tell you that there are the, the animals, the horses, and the hogs are thoughts. They're abstract ideas. They're concepts. The, the horses, and I, again, I tell you, this is an, a, a flaw, faulty allegory because of, of the nature of, of, of the horse. It's not perfect either, but, but the idea in the image is that the horse is in tune. The wild horses are in tune with their creation. They're in tune with their creator, and they're doing what they're called to do, and they're bringing life and beauty and majesty in the world. And so we have thoughts that are like wild horses. But we also can have thoughts that are like wild hogs. But as long as they're in the wilderness, as long as they're outside of us, as long as they're not part of us, as long as we do not take them into our homes and associate ourselves with them and begin to make them our own, then they're just thoughts. They're just ideas. They're just abstractions. They're just concepts. They're, ah, oh, but... But there's that moment, right? That moment when you harness the horse or you harness the hog or you wrap it up and you tie it and, and you bring it back and you put your mark on the hog and you take it into your, or the horse. This is what amor means. When you take the thought, you take the idea, the concept, you take the, the, the things of your mind that are floating around in the atmosphere in the world. And you reach up and you grab one and you put it into yourself and it comes out of your mouth and now you own it. <laughs> you have taken a thought, you've taken an idea, you've taken a vain imagination or you've taken a glorious vision, but whatever you have taken, you've taken it into yourself. And whenever it comes out of your mouth, that is amor. Now you own it. Whatever you say, is yours. Before you spoke it, it was wild and free. <laughs> it was just out there in your environment. But once you take it into yourself and you allow your mouth to frame it and give it vocabulary and give it vocalization and give it tone and give it emotion, once you do that, that is the Hebrew vision of and more. What will you take into you? What will you speak? What, this is why you know, creation was designed by not thought, by spoken word. This is the power of amor. The power of speech is to take ideas, to take visions, to take imagination, possibilities, and then produce out of that creative, prophetic, words that give shape and definition and dimension and hope of fulfillment to whatever the idea was. Now you understand why, hopefully, why and more is such an important passage. This is the final section, the final parsha of the Kedusha discourse. What began with uh, our holiness calling in Leviticus chapter 9 with the narrative of Nadav and Avahu and the shocking imagery of what happened whenever we do not walk in holiness, we do not flow in holiness, and we take ideas and then we reduce them to speech or action, uh, which is inconsistent with the plan, 
we see that, that be, and everything has happened since Leviticus 9, 9, 10, verse, chapter 11, chapter 12, 13, 14, 15. Everything has been divine about taking the holiness idea, the holiness vision of the Holy One into ourselves and giving it declaration, giving it vocabulary, giving it speech. And once you give it speech, you give it creative power. It has the power to in, inspire, to, in, to energize has the power to produce itself in the human mind and the human heart and the human hands and the human lives. Human cultures, human societies, human interactions. This is what Amor means. Now we're about to end the Kedusha Discourse. Chapter 24 with which Parsha, uh, Parsha Amor ends will end the discourse. And we will end with another narrative. We begin with a narrative, it's a bookend. We have a bookend narrative of Nadav and Abihu, and then we will end with an equally stunning narrative. Everything else has been divine speech. From the moment that Nadav and Abihu fell under the fire of the Holy One, till the, the, the next narrative begins, a man of, the, of a son of Israel, of, of a woman of Israel, and of a man of Mitzrim, of Egypt went out among the people and and he cursed and he blasphemed the Holy One and then we have the narrative so between those two narratives all those many chapters nothing has been spoken by motion nothing has been spoken of narrative it's all been divine discourse that's why we call it the Kedusha discourse this is the ultimate holiness discourse the calling of the Holy One you know, the book of Vaikra, uh, in English, we take the Latin phrase and we call it Leviticus because that's what the Catholic fathers taught us to call it. It is not even an English word, much less a Hebrew word. Leviticus is just what the Latin fathers of the, of the Catholic Church taught us to call it. What Vaikra is, the book is, is Vaikra, which is the Hebrew word, which means, and he called. The whole book of Leviticus, as we know it, Vaikra, is about the creator of the universe calling. Now, I can picture his, his voice calling out to that, that herd of wild horses on that valley. Hillside, and them responding to that voice. As I hope I would respond to that voice. And, and move in response to that voice. Now, this, the calling of the Holy One. I you, hope you've been feeling it. The calling of the Holy One. Now, every year, by virtue of the calendar the Creator's calendar, the book of Vaikra coincides with and is, forms the, the background or the wallpaper for this season called Sefirat HaOmer, the counting of the Omer. We're not actually counting the Omer, we're actually counting days. We're, we're numbering days. It's, it's like marking them on the wall, figuring out how many days are passed. There's a whole season of 49 days that we are designed to, to roll together as opposed to seeing as each individually, what's going to happen today, boss? The, every 49 days are a solid unit, a solid unit of increasing response to the call of holiness. How will we step up the call, the response to call of holiness today for 49 straight days? That's 49 steps up a ladder, 49 steps up a staircase from the earthly realm, from the fallen realm of living in Egypt and living with the hogs in the valley over here, letting them live in your home, being like unto them, being identified with the hog, the wild hog of, of a nature and of ideas. And now 49 times, 49 days, we step up one step every day higher into the realm of the divine, of the, of the holy. So this is that season that we're in. All right, I want to... Tell you it's Leviticus 21 through 24. I may have mentioned that. This is the uh, 19th day of ER, the second month, uh, according to the traditional calendar. And for all of those of you who follow a different calendar, uh, I have no animosity towards you whatsoever. I do not claim to be some sort of super official. 
I also respectfully would tell you, I don't consider you a, a, a particular expert in this field. We're all struggling. We're all seeking to find the appropriate level of the calendar of the Holy One. And as long as we realize we're all imperfect and nobody knows the answer to this, we can now begin to say, that's why I follow the traditional calendar, because nobody's come along yet with a better idea. <laughs> but it's the 19th day of ER, the 34th day of counting the Omer. That means we're past halfway. That means we're headed towards the home stretch. We're up 34 levels today into the way of thinking, the way of speaking, the way of, of identifying ourselves with the holy as opposed to the profane. All right. Now, our outline. This week, today, as you know me, you've, you've gotten to know me if you've watched these videos and you've been in this meeting, these fellowships. I never cover the entire parsha. I couldn't. I'd be here two weeks straight. I'd talk to you constantly. So I just hit highlights, and I just find, try to see what's the voice of the Holy One trying to speak into your life today and let myself become a, hopefully a vessel, uh, a portal, so to speak, of, of what he wants to speak to you. I don't have anything I want to tell you. Uh, he wants to tell you some stuff. The first element of Parsha uh, Emor, what Moshe has been given the instruction to speak and tell Aaron to speak to Amor, to bring light to life in the form of words that bring forth uh, created beings afterwards, is to speak about the advanced highest level of holiness, the highest level of Kedusha I have in this earth that we can know in this earth. We're not there. <laughs> I, you, I'm not there. Well, like I say, I'm just on day 34, imperfectly stepping up 34 steps to get into a little higher level for Shabbat so I can have the, a new Torah this year. We're, we're headed for a new Torah. That's what Shabbat is about, getting a new Torah. Not, not different, just new, <laughs> renewed, because we didn't, as we come holier this year, we'll be able to get more of its holiness. It's not going to change. There won't be new words. There won't be, <laughs> the text won't change. The message won't change. We will change. And because it will be like a new Torah to us. So we're only 34 steps toward a new Torah. Whew. As we get on Shavuot. And that new Torah is that as we, and as we receive the Ruach, as we receive the Holy Spirit, as we receive his enlightenment and let him saturate us and work his way through the synapses of our mind and work his way through the troubles and the trials of our flesh, and let, then we can begin to receive the Torah fresh and receive the Torah anew. Spirit-led, spirit-guided, spirit-taught. So that's where we are. But we are looking today, the Holy One wants to throw a vision out there for us. For those who will grab it, for those who will say, I want to bring that to my home. I want to bring that and identify with that in my life. A new level of <laughs> uh, wild horses, again, is a profane way of looking at it. But that's a new way of majestic idea that I can attach myself to, see it as an idea, and speak it as mine, make it mine. Well, the first thing is the advanced level of Kedusha that adheres to being a Kohen. Now, this a priest. You say, I'm not a priest. Well, let's, let's kind of go back a little bit and figure that out. First of all, who were the first priests? The first priests, the first ones who were called to Kohen, were actually not of the sons of Aaron. They were, they were not Aaron and his sons. They, they were the firstborn of, of all the tribes. The firstborn were the Kohanim. That, this was back in Egypt. This is, there were references to the Kohanim. This was the firstborns. And so we have this substitution at a later date, the substitution of Aaron. So are you a firstborn? Well, if you're a firstborn male. Are you a firstborn male of your family? Uh, second of all, we, then we have the, 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 the Kohanim, and we have this, the sons of Aaron, the, the Levitical line. And you might be surprised how many of you, if you checked your bloodline and it was really accurate, which I'm not too sure some of these methodologies we use today are, but if it was really an accurate bloodline, you might be surprised how much Ko Kohan blood bloodline you actually have within you. It's been so spread. This is part of the plan of the creator of the universe, all right? that it would happen. He knew it would happen. This is part of his foreknowledge. Now we need to be careful with it, and we'll talk about that later too, but this is that idea. Now thirdly, the, the prophets make it very clear that there will be many who will be, become priests. 
who are not of the lineage of Aaron. The, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the whole priesthood of Melchizedek that is referenced from the Psalms all the way through the letters of the Brit Hadashah. This is the, in the book of Hebrews. This is concept is that we will all become priests. Peter, Kepha, <laughs> who will say to us, he'll say to us that you are a royal priesthood. And he's referring back to the same promise that was made on, in Exodus 19, that we would become a, a, pre, a kingdom of priests. And it's later said that we would be kings, in English we read it kings and priests. But in, in the Hebrew mindset, it's just a, a kingdom of priests. <laughs> it's not that we're separate kings from priests. We are a kingdom of priests. So this is our calling. And so if you, unless you just throw away these special Kedusha protocols of the Kohan, realize this is your ideal. This is the, the imagination, the vision of the creator of the universe for you. That you would be so consecrated, so dedicated, so focused on your purpose and your mission upon the earth, so focused on your love of humanity. I mean, we talked last week, neighbor love, brother love, stranger love, rich man love, poor man love, working man love, the man love, deaf man love, blind man love, daughter in trouble love. This was the essence of the center point of the message. Now with this in mind, this idea of this level of holiness, this is our goal, this is our focus, to live in that realm. Well, this is what we'll talk about, the advanced levels of Kedusha of the Kohan, and what it requires you. Let's think about Kedusha, think about holiness. And I'm not talking about some idea where you, you think you're better than other people because you, no, it's because you realize who you are, why you're here, and why certain things are just not going to be consistent with what you're doing. It's not that you're going to hell or somebody else is going to hell because they're doing it. That isn't even the issue. The issue becomes, is this consistent with the redemptive, restorative plan of the Holy One as operative in my life, or is it not? And you will choose more and more to re re reject and do away with and avoid and overcome all those things which are inconsistent with the redemptive, restorative plan of the Holy One for your life. You can start picturing things in your mind. We'll maybe talk about a few of them. But the uh, advanced level of holiness of the Kohen. The first thing he's going to talk about the Holy One wants us to say, he wants us to, to express, to take the vision and begin to speak it. And the first phrase that he uses is, Lenechesh lo yitama. Uh, that's Hebrew. I, Lenechesh lo yitama. Now, in your English versions of Leviticus 21, 1 and 2, you're going to find something along the lines of, talking to the Kohen, the priest. And he is not to make himself unclean. Lo <laughs> yitama. He is not to make himself unclean. For in English Bibles, I see this amazing statement that follows that. For the dead. For a dead person. For a, among his people. Be'ama. <laughs> I I see that, and, I, and then I look at the Hebrew, because this is a book that was written in Hebrew that was spoken, given emor in the first place in Hebrew, and I say, is that what it says? <laughs> is that what it says for the dead? That all these things can be written off because they're only in dealings with the dead. And then I look at it again. And I do you remember the first word I said before yo yitima? Before yo yo lo yitima was the word le nefesh for a nefesh what well, you know what a you know what a dead body is not <laughs> a dead body is not a nefesh cannot be a nefesh a dead body cannot be a nefesh because a nefesh means a breathing like living breathing being and so <laughs> What we're looking at here is not about making yourself unclean or taking on the uncleanness, contagious tuma of something that's dead, someone that's dead. We're talking about taking on the uncleanness of someone 
that's alive. Someone that we may have contact with. Someone that's in our home or in our workplace. Someone that's in our marketplace, in the line in front of us, or in the, on the park bench beside us. Someone, this is a nephesh. What's a nephesh? <laughs> a nephesh is not a, 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 a basar met, a, a dead body, a dead flesh. That's not what, there's words to say dead body. That's, these are not them. <laughs> And so we have this idea that for, for a living being, for a living person, we are not to take on their uncleanness. So let's skip forward to Yeshua just for a second. Let's let him define the ultimate picture of what this uncleanness means. What did he say makes a man unclean? Makes a nephesh unclean? <laughs> it's the thoughts that you take into yourself and more. It's the wild hogs of vain imaginations, the wild hogs of angry thought and malice and, and theology and theory and all the stuff that is abstract in its conceptualization, all its concepts and all its abstracts and all of its principles and all the things that you take into your head and then you speak out and out of it you see the heart flowing and, and you see what happens with those things is they demonstrate themselves as malicious, malice, murders, adulterous, lusty. Uh, uh, what was the other phrase that he, he used? Lewdness. Lewd, with profane, with uh, bodily function fo focus. You, you hear conversations like this all the time, right? This is normal in our world. This is normal where the hogs, where the wild hogs roam. That we we'll talk about bodily functions and laugh about them and snicker and, and do this. That we talk about profane words and profane ideas and abstract concepts. And, and we, we, we make gods of them. We have abstract. Make, we have created, this is make, not make a God mold. A God mold is just something that we make very important in our life. We take something, give it shape, and make it very important. Uh, one of the current, there's so many in today's world, these abstractions we have turned into gods. One of them is, is our concept of social justice. It's an abstract concept. It has no reality to it. Social justice is a figment of our imagination. It's a vain imagination that we wish to put down here. And then we attach emotion to it, malice to it. You're not walking in social justice. You're on the wrong side of social justice. And we define human beings in terms of where they fall in our paradigm of social justice. Well, there's so many more theological concepts and, and philosophical concepts and political concepts concepts and when you lose the touch of a human being and a real person involved and you take it into the realm of abstract thought which is what the Greek world teaches you to do the Greek world is fascinated by the wild hog and therefore it brings the wild hog into everything and the thing we celebrate in the Greek Greco-Roman Greco culture and mindset is abstract ideas and concepts and principles and the whole one says that is unclean that is taking on uncleanness because you see the holy is where we're going we're going to the holy and the holy is always dealing with 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 what rest, rest uh, restoration with redemption this is what we're focusing on so the holy one will begin to talk to us about what it is that we, what wild hogs are we taking into our house what wild hogs of other people are we embracing what wild hogs of a political party or what wild hogs of a, of a particular culture. What wild, roaming, rooting, destructive forces of a culture or a nation or a person or a community or a family are we taking into ourselves and repeating and speaking. Now this, this is one of those things why I 
truly value social media because I am not to take on the tuma, the uncleanness of anyone else. Lo yitama. Le nefesh lo yitama. The whole higher realms of holiness is to learn, to find, to, to seek out, to understand, not to judge, but to seek out and say, that's not mine. So social media performs a very valuable function for me. It shows me what I am to lo yitama. That is the, so I'm not to agree with virtually anything. <laughs> but I have to see what other people are saying so I know what it looks like and smells like and tastes like. And learn not to be upset by it. Learn not to be offended by it, not to be insulted by it, not to be aggrieved by it. Learn merely to say, it's not mine. It's not mine to take on. It's not my war to fight. It's not my battle. I am climbing the steps to holiness. I am doing the will of the Holy One. That is my purpose in my call upon the earth, to take on the higher levels of holiness. Well, we'll go on from the higher levels of holiness to what is usually called the festivals. There is a whole of chapter 23. Majestic vision the Holy One tries, is trying to download. And it is a radical vision. What he's basically saying to is, do you know how the world functions, how the nations and the ethnicities of the world function? They assign value to abstract concepts and then make days for them. Make celebratory seasons for them. And they take historic events and historic personas and they attach value to them that they as pre associate with a given day somebody's birthday somebody's day of death somebody's we we do these things do you see what the world is doing do you see how they structure their calendar do you see they have no rhyme or reason to their calendar they start the day at midnight and they start the year in on January 1st, which is where? Nowhere. <laughs> and and the, you see what my son of man, do you see? Do you see profanity? Do you see uh, wild hogs in the valley? <laughs> do you understand what they're doing? They're just rooting. They're just eating junk and trash and, and letting their natural processes work in that area and filling the area with that fertilizer. That's what they're doing with that calendar. And now they celebrate. We're, we're about to have it in the United States of America. We're about to have a day that I, I it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's called Memorial Day. We're going, the, and, and it has, in, as worldly things go, as man-contrived ideas go, the theory is somewhat Okay, we're going to memorialize what? Someone who gave a sacrifice, who, who dedicated their lives to a nation, to our country, to our freedom. We're going to, but, but what really happens? We don't, that doesn't, wasn't what happens. That's not what Memorial Day is. You know what Memorial Day is? Memorial Day is a holiday, a day of school. We get off work, we get off whatever, we go on a vacation, we go on a trip. We, we don't, it's just a, wild hog we brought into our house and we brought the stink but we haven't got the hog <laughs> well that's just memorial day i mean every one of our then we're going to have independence day in america we're going to we're going to have abstract concepts flowing everywhere and we might shoot off some firecrackers or go to a firework show but do you realize we're not even connected to that's not even connecting to the, the, the thing of the, which the abstract vain imagination we grabbed a hold of it. It's, this is how men do it. Son of man. Son of man, do you see what men do? <laughs> do you understand that this may be natural, National Pizza Day? I don't know what, what the day may be. Nonsense. Total nonsense. All based upon some level of fleshly curiosity or appetite. Grandparents Day. Mother's Day. Father's Oh, I'm getting into sacred territory, but... I'm not gonna, 
if, if you think about it, it's kind of like I talked about Thanksgiving last week, and I, I don't mean to, to, I'm just saying, son of man, do you see? The best they've got to offer is, is profane. You're going to set aside a day for Mother's Day? I mean, I remember Susan and, and when her birthday came along, and everybody wanted to make her food for her and bring her stuff in, in, in bed, but they didn't know how to do it, so they had to ask her how to do it, so she had to teach him how to It's like, okay. Well, in a sense. Now, all I'm trying to say is, do you know how the world does special days? And if you know how the world does special days, you will understand what Paul was talking about. It says, let no man judge you over one of these special days, over, over the celebration of Saturnalia or the celebration of, of Independence Day or the celebration of Valentine's Day or the celebration of this. That is not your world. That's the wild hog world. Come over to the wild horse world. Come over to the majestic creature who's in tune with creation because I've got a new calendar for you. I've got a whole different way of looking at the world that is designed to call forth holiness. And this is a holiness calendar. It's a Kedusha calendar. The Kedusha calendar keeps us focused on his holiness as opposed to what men do, what men did, what we like, what our flesh likes, what our sentiment gets our flesh involved in. I uh, don't have time to go through some of the holidays we do. You don't want me to go through some of the holidays that the men celebrate and, and point out the obvious issues with them. I'm not trying to talk about pagan stuff. I just want the obvious issues with the, the holidays that, and the calendar that men follow. Well, he's going to give us another idea. He says, I want you to look in the, at the wild horses in the meadow. I want to look at, at the idea that I am going to project into your world sanctified time, a way of scheduling what you will say and how you will project my holiness into your world. That's the one thing the other festival, other holidays, other days that men celebrate cannot do. They cannot take the holy and bring it into the world. They cannot. They just are not focused. That's not what they're there for. That's something totally foreign. To, they don't even have a concept of what that would look like. And so he's going to give us this whole chapter when he's going to download to us these pods of holiness. What is holy time? How do you make time holy? How do you make time the evidence of the unseen as opposed to the remembrance of the seen? How do you make time the evidence of the unseen? rather than the remembrance of the seen. How do you make time the evidence of the unseen rather than the remembrance of the seen? This is the criteria. Now, he's going to start with, he says, these are two things. He's going to say there are, there are two different things. I call them two ways. They are moedim and they are mikraot. Mikraot kodeshim. Uh, so we have these two things. If we understand the way the creator has designed this calendar, we are to follow. And these uh, downloads of special seasons and times that we are to live according to. This is our schedule of events. This is our agenda. This calendar. We're living in this. That's why I told you earlier, this is the 19th day of ER. <laughs> this is not just the first day of May. This is the 19th day of AR, and that's the real day. And one May is this, uh, the, what the hogs are doing down here in the village. 19 ER. And not only is it 19 ER, it's the 34th day when we are to be counting, counting down, counting up as it really is, counting up to the 49th level and then the 50th level of holiness where we get a new Torah because we're new people. Because we're refreshed and renewed. This is what's really happening in the world. We're under an illusion. We're under a delusion that somehow or other what's really happening is this is May 1st. <laughs> and we're, we're headed towards Memorial Day. School's about to be out. All the things that we think uh, there's going to be a new year of TV and cars. And that's what we're thinking is going on. He says, no, what's really going on is my redemptive plan is ongoing. My redemptive restorative plan is having its effect, and I have time-released messages for you to proclaim, for you to exhibit. This is not parties that you celebrate. These are things that you're designed strategically in season to release when I tell you to release them, to and more. 
and to live them out. So he's going to talk to us about first thing about this, the seventh day Sabbath. He says, you know, I'm going to want you to understand that this seventh day is, is not, it's not a day to have services, church services, and synagogue services. The seventh day, you may or may not have those. That is not the purpose of it. The purpose of the seventh day is so that the earth and its people, my people in particular, can receive an infusion of two things. Blessing. The blessing of the Holy One. Shalom. Well, this is the answer. This is a day of blessing. He blessed the seventh day. It's that blessing still there. That blessing is still resounding, re resonating. The blessing is still pulsing. When Shabbat, when the sun, uh, ever of Shabbat, when the sun goes down on Friday afternoon, as we call it, the sixth day, the sun goes down on that sixth day, that blessing begins to increase in volume. That blessing begins to fill the atmosphere in the air, and the, horse, the wild horses hear it. But the wild hogs just carry on their business. They just keep on eating junk and trashing and doing their stuff. But the wild horses hear it. Those who are envisioning the, the creation in tune with its creator hear it, and they sense that blessing is now over them and over their household and over their children and their children's children and over their city and over their village and over their country. Not because of the country, because it's the blessing. It's what the blessing does. It, it touches, it heals, it restores, it brings hope and life. It brings purpose and meaning and direction to every aspect of things it touches. That's the blessing of God. So the first thing we should do on Shabbat is to understand this is our day to reconnect with the blessing. That's one of the patterns of Erev Shabbat in the traditional Jewish household is you take your wife, you take your children to yourself, and you bless them. You just repeat what the Father does. You do, see what you, you do what you see the Father doing. You, you don't do something out of some sort of ceremony or creed. It, you do what you see your Father doing, and he is blessing, so you bless your own children, your own sphere of influence. So the first thing that we learn about the Shabbat is that it, it's a day of of blessing, but you need to cease some things. You got to stop some things in order to be able to catch that blessing. You got to stop rooting with the hogs. <laughs> you got to stop digging up people's pastures with your ideas and with your words. You, you got to stop that. You got to cease that. You come to a place of rest because when you come to a place of rest, you, you know how this is. I, I am of a certain age now, and while I am counting on a divine miracle to restore my hearing to its early stages and quality, sometimes I have to actually pretty much stop, tune out intentionally other noises so I can hear what my wife is saying to me. Focus on it. Fixate on it. Really, this is the idea of Shabbat. I, I, I've learned to be able to catch. I've got to tune out stuff in order to hear what's really happening. Hear the blessing. I hope you understand. If you don't tune out, you will continue to hear the same things you always hear, but you won't hear the, the most important message, which is your beloved speaking to you. <laughs> well, uh, rabbit trail? Okay, just a short one, hopefully. There are the bookends of Parsha Imor are two narratives. The bookends of this, the background season of of this whole counting the Omer season that we're in leading up to Shavuot, the bookends are the Song of Solomon at the beginning, at the first bookend, and the book of Ruth at the end of the book at, at Shavuot. So we are modulating from the Song of Solomon through into the book of Ruth. That's what's going on really. We're, and do you know those two books? If you know those two books at all, you know the sound of the voice of your beloved. You begin to feel the sense of his calling upon your life and, and how yeah, this is, this is tra transcendent. It, it takes you higher. It takes you deeper. This is a, 
This is the voice of your beloved speaking to you, calling you, calling you, calling you, marrying you in the, in the state, bringing you to a place of fruitfulness where you're producing, reproducing after the seed, the royal seed, taken from whatever your nation is. Now, this is, this is the season that we are in. This is the calling that's going on. And to realize that that's the, some of the calling you'll catch these Shabbats, these Sabbaths during this period of time. Well, I didn't mention the holiness factor. I talked about that blessing factor. But the other factor is he said not only did he bless the seventh day, but he made it holy. He built holiness into it. It carries a level of Kedusha. So what is Kedusha? It's not a, it, it is energy. It is empowering, inspiring energy. It's what happens when you're in the beauty realm and you're caught up in the majesty and the wonder and the awe of it. And suddenly you're energized and empowered. And this is what renewal or revival or, re, or re, re restoration is all about. He restores you. His energy, his beauty, his glory, his majesty, his weight. Uh, worshipers understand this. If you get into that realm, suddenly it doesn't matter how tired you are. It doesn't matter how your fingers hurt if you're a guitar player. You've been playing for the last four hours. It doesn't matter suddenly when you hit that. You know how tired your voice is if you're a singer and you, you're almost raspy, but suddenly, suddenly you find that level of his holiness. You reach into that holy place and his holiness touches you and you're empowered and energized beyond physical ability and capacities to do so. I hope you've ever felt that in your life. I hope you feel it today. I hope you felt it recently. Same thing when you're reading the Torah, when you're reading the Bible or reading the words of the Messiah. There's a certain place at which you, you, you pass through this invisible barrier, which is your pseudo-intellectual mind trying to argue with God or trying to reason with God or trying to reason it out and logically figure it out. And you pass through this barrier, and on the other side, oh, wow. He's there. <laughs> he's with you. He's moving. He's, he's majestic. He's... A stag, a, a majestic on the mountains. He's, he's more than words on a page. He's more than a concept. He's more than an idea. He, he's our beloved. Now this is this idea of taking his holiness, finding his holiness. This is a, Sabbath is a time that we are designed every week, every seven days, we're designed to, to step through that veil or through that, that, that separation. To quit just thinking of him in theological terms. To quit <laughs> focusing on abstract principles and concepts and ideas. And to just be amazed, astonished, enthralled by his majesty, by his beauty, by his goodness, by his power. And that will energize you and that will inspire you. Now... I said, this is not about having a meeting or having a worship service or having a, any kind of... That's not what this is about. I, there's a whole denomination that made that about this, made this about that. I love you. That's not what this is about. If you, if you happen to sh come here, if we happen to join us by broadcast, either on the Sabbath or after the Sabbath, this is not about us having a meeting. If this is not about us going through the veil together, going through this, this paradigm and, and entering into his presence and drawing down this holiness into our beings and into our souls where we can, and more, where we can speak it and where we can live it in the next week, then it's a waste of everybody's time. But if perhaps by some chance the Creator empowers and inspires us to find a place where we can together pierce through that veil and go into his presence and hear his voice draw his holiness into our and absorb it into our being if that be the case then may it continue forever and ever well <laughs> we will then begin to say after the holy one downloads all the different moedim all the different days strategically assigned to release certain new aspects of his redemptive plan and we do it every year repeats every year he says i need to repeat this in your ears and in your lives and in your family's lives every year i want you to give the strategic message and more of the strategic message through each of the seasons that i give you and then he's going to go into chapter 24 of leviticus 
and in chapter 24, the theme will slightly change. Beginning the first part of the chapter, he will talk to us about, okay, day by day. I've given you the picture of all the seasons and all the special days. I've talked to you of the Sabbath of every seventh day. I've talked to you about the Pesach, the Passover, and about the song of the Passover. Then I talked about the first day of first fruits and waving the barley, uh, waving the barley and surrendering the crop of the entire year to the, to the, to the Holy One. I've, I've talked to you about this, about all productivity from that point forward being surrendered to, to the Creator. I've talked to you then about the counting of the Omer, the Sefirat HaOmer, about keeping up, spreading out, seeing more than just today. More than just what's on your agenda today. Seeing that we're part of this big ascendance. This taking the songs of ascent and going up the hill to the Holy Hill to Zion over 50 days. Getting a new Torah. I've talked to you about Shavuot. He's talked to us about Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets. The day of sounding. The days of the voice shouting. We, he's talked to us about the day of atonement, Yom Kippur. He's talked to us about Sukkot, the first day, the seventh day. Talked to us about the eighth day. Talked to us about all these different special times of downloading holiness and blessing into our world. And then in chapter 24, he begins to talk to us about, okay, now, now you've got responsibilities every day. That, those are your special days. But here's your everyday stuff. Everyday stuff, number one. Everyday thing, number one, oil. <laughs> Oil for the lamp. Oil for the lamp in the, in, the, in the menorah, in the holy place. Keep your focus upon what's going on in the holy place, not what's going on around you. What's going on around you will kill you. It's a bunch of wild hogs rooting <laughs> with ideas, put it, trying to put ideas and, and, and concepts and fighting over those things and fighting over abstractions and fighting over principles and losing their focus and going crazy and going wild and just making a mess of everything. That's what's around you. Don't focus on that. Focus upon your bringing, keeping the light of the world burning. Your part, your part to play. You've got to trust the, the creator is going to do this. You've got to trust the high priest is going to be in the holy place. Trimming those lamps. doing what. He, but you trust the, that and you do your part, which is to bring the oil. Keep supplying the high priest with oil. Keep coming back. Keep bringing the, the best. Make sure it's pressed. It's pure. It's crushed. All the things, the oil, and I won't have time to talk to you about the oil in this room today, but you understand that the idea is to maintain a process where every day we know that this is being done. Every day. We don't have a chance to do it once a week, ever on, the, on a holiday season. Okay? This is an everyday job. Every day that we live, every day we have breath. We are to be in contact with the priest, the high priest, Melchizedek, the Holy One, Yeshua, the Messiah. We are to be in contact with him, and we are to be sharing our oil that he may then spread throughout the world and bring the light of the world. Okay, that's one. The second thing is the bread, the, the table of Shabbat. Once a Shabbat, every Shabbat. Now, th there's a very interesting legend here. I'll, let me just tell you this. Every seventh day, every Shabbat, the Kohanim in the holy place are to bring and lay out fresh loaves of bread, one for every tribe of Israel. And it's covered with frankincense. And it's goes to the heat of the of the hot fresh bread now permeating through and, and changing chemically that frankincense, filling the air with the smell of fresh bread and released frankincense ions. So that now that's a smell. That's a scent. That's the fragrance of Mashiach right there. We got the oil on the one hand and the and now we've got this fragrance that tells you the bread of life is on the table. <laughs> There is hope, there is life, and it is healing because frankincense is, a, is an analgesic. It is the ultimate healer of all the fragrances, all the scents, all the substances of the earth. And so if, there is healing in the house. There is bread in the house. The healing is the children's bread. So things that make sense when you get, understand this picture. Now, every day we're to bring the oil. Every week we're to, to, to realize and bring the bread and connect with the bread. Now, they're legend. The legend, and I, I speak these things because they help illustrate points. Not to tell you they're true, not true. The, the interpretation of the, of the priest, apparently, uh, allegedly, uh, legend by legend, was that the bread that they put on the table of showbread on the Sabbath would continually stay warm throughout the week. You say, that's fantasy. I, I, don't, I don't care whether you... That's not, the issue is not whether it's true. The issue is whether you can picture it. Can you, can you envision that if God does something, 
He can make it fresh constantly, not just do it once. If you don't get this, you won't understand why we do Passover. We're not commemorating a historic event. Well, we are, but that's, that's just the beginning point. That's just the point of beginning. We're saying he can do it again. <laughs> he is doing it again. He's always doing it again. The, the Passover is not what he did before. The Passover is part of our lives. It's part of our being. It's part of our essence. It's part of our purpose and being. So he's doing it now. And looking around, saying, he's doing it in you. He's doing it in my world. He's doing it in these situations. Same thing with regard to all the things we commemorate. They're not historic commemorate, unlike worldly celebrations. They are not about his story. They're about his story. That is about his story. And so this process. So he begins to talk to us about the bread. And the legend is that, that the priests were telling everybody that this bread would stay warm all week long and continue to release that fragrance. Now, they're the only ones who would know because they're the only ones who are in the holy place, but that's what they would say. And the legend is that the son of Shalomit, daughter of the tribe of Dan, who had been involved during slavery with a man from Egypt, the Egyptian man, uh, of the Egyptian culture, trained and raised in the Egyptian culture, and he, he either married or had an illicit relationship with, maybe by force, maybe by consent. We don't know what does consent even mean in that context. And, and there was a child born of that union, the son of Shelomet, of the tribe of Dan. And he came forth out of Egypt with Shelomet, with the family, with the home, and he was... There he came through the Red Sea, the Sea of Reeds, I should say. He came through Matan Torah, and he heard the voice of the creator of the universe like every other person in this camp. They heard the voice. They didn't just hear the words. They heard the voice. He saw the rumbling and the thunders and the lightnings and heard the shofar from heaven. He saw. He was through this process. He walked with them that entire. He was there. He survived the golden calf incident. He survived all, the, all that stuff. He's been there. He saw the tabernacle built. He may have participated in building it. He may have brought gold or silver or, or, or fabric or something with him from Egypt. And, and he participated in that process. And then he saw the, the, the filling of that temple, the, the <laughs> mole, the male, the filling of that tabernacle by the Holy One on the first day of Nisan of this year, uh, that year. And, and he saw that happen. And he saw every, he was one of those millions that fell on their faces and worshiped and sang the song of the fire, which I equate with the song of the sea, but it was just with fire. <laughs> The spontaneous song that is mentioned, Rone, in, in, in the Hebrew, when it talks about that fire falling from heaven in, in Leviticus 9. He sang the song of the fire. But suddenly he hears these Kohen excitedly talking, supposedly, about the fact that the, the, this bread that they put on the altar, uh, excuse me, on the table of showbread, kept release, kept, it stayed hot the entire week, and it kept releasing this spring, a supernatural event. And he scoffed. And he was incensed by the fact that someone would say this was, that, that could happen, that did happen. And he wanted a, a reasonable faith. He wanted people to, to just believe good stuff and, and do some good stuff. But he wasn't ready for this behind-the-veil supernatural stuff. He wasn't ready for anything that was beyond the ordinary natural realm. He'd seen the sea split. He'd seen the fire fall from heaven. But somehow or other, he heard that, <laughs> that the bread was still hot after seven days. And frankincense was still being uh, metamorphosized and, and released in the air uh, by this warm bread, and he couldn't handle that. And so he began to deny it. That's all the legend. But the story is real. Whether that's the reason for the story or whether that's just something, a legend to try to tell you. Or do you believe? Do, do you trust the Holy One to do stuff? Do you have a supernatural vision? Do you have a hope for more than just what your mind can conceive and think of? Do you want God put in your box? <laughs> or do you, are you ready to run with the wild horses? Well, 
whether that's the reason or whether it's not the reason, what happened is real. And what happened is the man, the, the son of Shelomit, half Egyptian, half Hebrew of the tribe of Dan, he goes out in the camp. And this is the closing narrative of the Kedoshim Discourse. And let me tell you, this is the unit test. You see, everything the Holy One talks to you about Kedusha is not something that you study in a vacuum. It's not something you read about in a study hall. It's not something you meditate on in your concept, in, in, your, in your time of, of private time. The protocols of Kedusha have to be brought down into real life. They have to be brought down into real time. They have to be applied in real life situations, in controversies, in difficult stages, in difficult times. The, this is how, this is the idea on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom Kedusha protocols have to be brought to the earth and deal with real life situations. So here's your unit test. Right in your camp, right in front of you. Everything was so peaceful. We have had how many months now? We have had four and a half months. Nobody's argued about anything. The building of the tabernacle, the shalom, the sweet season of shalom, the prototypical kingdom of heaven, the prototypical messianic kingdom has, has manifested itself for four and a half months. We've had no arguments. We've had nobody fighting about stuff, nobody arguing about stuff, nobody jealous, nobody envious, nobody angry. Our peace has been, shalom has been glorious. It's been like heaven. Yeah. <laughs> It's been like heaven on earth. And suddenly, your little corner of heaven on earth hears this noise, this loud, angry voice, this scuffling and tussling, blows being struck. Four and a half months we have it. And this is like, this doesn't belong here. This kind of acrimony, this kind of noise, this kind of arrogance, this kind of pride, this kind of uh, division, this doesn't belong in this realm. I hope you feel that. I hope you understand now why you, ha you need to, if you're still on it, keep watching social media because it should be telling you every day, this does not belong. It doesn't matter who's right and who's wrong. Nobody's right. Everybody's wrong. It isn't even about that. The issue is this does not, this is not mine. This is not ours. This is not why we're here. This is not what we're about. This is not the purpose of life. This is not wild horse stuff. This is wild pig stuff. Well, so they, you hear it, you're in the camp. And it's just like, no, we left all that behind in Egypt. We left all that arrogance and that pride and that conceptualization, abstractualization. We left all that nonsense back in, in Egypt or Babylon or Rome or USA. We left all that stuff behind. We, we're climbing the, the hill, Jacob's ladder. <laughs> We're going up Jacob's ladder, rung by rung. And what are you doing? Who, are you, who is that down there? Who is that profane person down there? Why are you doing this, bringing this into our camp? And why are you allowing it? Why are we allowing it? Well, the, the fight intensifies. The struggle increases. And suddenly the, the emotion tide. The son of Shelomit gets his surfboard, and he starts surfing that tide. Man, he's, he's catching a wave. He's hanging ten on anger and resentment and, and pride and arrogance, and he's catching all the emotions, and every one of them, he's in the, well, what do they call the tunnel? With the, I mean, what is it? What is it? Barrel, the barrel. He's in the barrel. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Now, and so he's, and in the process of doing it, suddenly 
you know, when you're in that process, when you're riding the emotion tide, when you're surfing the emotion tide, you know what? You can't hear anything the creator of the heavens is saying. You don't even care what he's saying. You could care less what he's saying, what he has said, what he's about, what he's for. The emotion tide has you. It owns you. It's like the wild hog. The wild hog is possessing you, and you're just along for the ride. And out of your mouth, you want to say something intelligent and erudite and open your mouth and out comes... Most of what you hear in this world is wild hog. <laughs> now, so he comes and he does two things. There's two things that he does. He's called the blasphemer in traditional uh, discussions. And that's one of the things he does. But the first thing he does is before he blasphemes, he curses. And the Hebrew word is kalal and the, for, for curse. And the second, there's old words for cursing in Hebrew. And they mean different things, but kalal means to mm, dehumanize, devalue. It's not some sort of uh, witchcraft curse. It's not some sort of uh, imprecation. It just, if I want to say something that dehumanizes you, devalues you, put labels on you, say negative things about you, belittle you would be a good word to put it. So the first thing he does is... He looks at the fellow Hebrew, he's at least half fellow Hebrew, the Hebrew who is trying to calm him down and settle him down, and he kalals him. He, he speaks negativity about him. He speaks uh, belittling words that diminish his, maybe his motivation, maybe it was about his, his looks, maybe it was about his, his speech, what he said. He finds ways to pick at and criticize his fellow Hebrew. Hebrew. This is Kalal. Again, watch social media very carefully. It teaches you the lessons of Kalaling. Watch what you say because when you diminish any other human being, you say, oh, but they're, they're jerks. They're liars. They're thieves. They're, they're crooked. They're what? Is that your business? Is that your job? Is that taking you on the steps up to the heaven? Is that what the Holy One's saying? Or is that what the emotion tide, that's just where you are in the barrel of the emotion tide being caught up and carried, swept away by this wild hog mentality. So, so he says, first thing he does is kalal. And the first thing he will do is kalal. Whenever you lose the, the impact, when you lose the ability to pass through the membrane and, and you only live down in this realm and you keep focusing on the wild hogs and what the wild hogs are doing, you will eventually kalal the people. And you will hear it come out of your mouth. And once you say it, you own it. Here's that bad thing the Holy One keeps telling you. Careful what judgment you use. It's not because I'm mad at you, I hate you. You're releasing the same judgment back upon yourself. You are creating your own disaster. <laughs> You're creating your own pit that you will fall in. When you call somebody else uh, a negative name, a, 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 a derogatory label, when you apply a diminishing, dehumanizing approach to them and speak that, that process, that means it is guaranteed to come back to you multiple times because this is the law of the harvest. What you sow, you will reap, and you will wonder why they're saying such bad things about you because you've introduced the kalal into the world. And once it's there, once it's active, it's like the wild hog. It's going to tear up everything it sees. And it's going to leave behind a, a brood of more wild hogs wherever you left. Now, this is the critical factor. So the first thing the blasphemer does, the first thing the son of Shelomit does, is to kalal. Now, if we can stop from kalaling, we can make sure we don't do the other thing. But we have to learn not to kalal. We have to learn to separate ourselves out, to, to take on holiness instead of taking on the, the energy of the wave of, of the emotion tide. We have to learn to be able to hold the holiness inside, hold it, maintain it, and not go down the Kalal road because once we go down the Kalal road, it will lead to the other road. Now, we, we can Kalal 
other people. We can say belittling things, negative derogatory remarks about them, sarcastic uh, derogatory remarks about other people that we disagree with, that are doing stuff wrong, that are doing bad stuff, whatever the case may be, as we wander around the hog pen down here. We can see all sorts of stuff down there. It's stinky. It's bad. Now, once we kalal, we open the door for more kalaling, and that's what we do. We now become a... A, a, a pigsty. We make, turn every place we are into a pigsty. You can turn Facebook, social media. You can turn TikTok, uh, Pinterest. You can turn anything into a pigsty real quick. Just start calling. But don't, don't, don't do it. Try to learn to, to withhold your, your urge to call. Don't give it voice. Don't immore. <laughs> don't immore it. Because once you immore it, you own it. And once you own it, it reproduces itself. And turns itself on you. Why do you not cast your pearls before swine? <laughs> Why? Why do you not give that which is holy to the dogs? Well, once you open that door, it comes. Well, here, this, and it's going to lead you to a place. It's going to lead you. You were just calling people before, and their ideas and their concepts and their abstracts. Now he says, that, but you're going to take that road. This continuum is going to lead you to a place, and you're going to blaspheme. Now, you can't blaspheme human beings. You can't blaspheme governments. You can't blaspheme ideas. You can't blaspheme world systems. You can't blaspheme ethnicities. The only person you can blaspheme is your creator, the, the bridegroom king who is calling you, who is wooing you, who, who is behind your wall, behind the lattice, calling your name. And you can to blaspheme. And, and the Hebrew word is nachab. Nachab. Nakab means to hollow out, to disembowel, to take all the insides out and leave nothing but a shell, to take all the essence of the Holy One, to blaspheme him is to take away his essence, to take away his, what is his essence? Mercy, merciful, merciful, compassionate, slow to anger, forgiving. Remembering, faithful to visit, to come back and visit over and over again. You take, you disembowel him. You take away the essence of who he is and you leave just an outer shell of who he is. And you present that false image to the world. Now that's what it means to Nakab, the blasphemer. And so first you see it when you see it directed towards other human beings, the kalaling. And then you see it whenever it begins to turn and you take away the mercy and the compassion and the forgiveness and the faithfulness to covenant and the goodness and the forgiveness and the faithfulness to walk over people and bloodlines. And you take that out of the imagery of God. And he becomes an, an image to you. He becomes a, an idea to you. He becomes a, a concept, an abstraction in your mind. And you become a wild hog, more kalaling every day, more nakabing every day. He says, oh, my people, I'm calling you to something much higher than this. And he finishes, if I can get to it. I know my time is about up, so I want to have one little reading. If you would stand with me. From right at the center of this parsha, there is a little short section from Leviticus chapter 22, verses 31 to 35. And we'll read it in just a second as I have it on my screen. Before we do that, I would invite you to all join with me if you would and speak the blessing of the house. And if you do not remember the blessing of the house, then just enjoy and listen. Hopefully it will be a blessing to you, but this is the blessing of his word that we speak in this house. Open our eyes, O Holy One, that we may see wondrous things in your Torah. For we are but strangers in the earth. Do not hide your commandments from us. 
our souls cry out for your judgments at all times. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your Torah. For your Torah is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Amen. Beginning with 31, verse 31 of chapter 22, Shemara my mitzvah, keep my commandments, and asa them, do them, build them. I am the Holy One. You are not to profane kalal. You're not to kalal my holy name, but I am to be kadash, brought into fullness of holiness among the children of Israel. I am the Holy One who kadashes you, who makes you holy, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Holy One. You are maybe seated. Well, the Kedusha Discourse concludes today. It almost concludes with the narrative of the blasphemer. That was your unit test. How well did you incorporate the things we've been learning about Kedusha? Are you ready to put the things we have been learning about Kedusha to real life practice? Because you're down here in the pig pen area. You're living down here in this world where stuff's happening. But your focus should be, have you been able to bring the Kedusha discourse? Now he says, now here's the problem. You're going to have situations arise like this. And when they arise, you need to have a vision for more than what the world around you has a vision for. There will be violent attacks, angry attacks, and injuries that take place in your world. The last few verses, last few words of Parsha, uh, uh, Parsha uh, Emor are telling you that now here are the ideas, here are the ways of jurisprudence in the kingdom. It's shocking. Two things have no place. Retribution and vengeance. If you're angry, sit this one out. If you're offended, go take a seat. If you're thinking about how much this person deserves, what bad punishment they deserve for what they did, Excuse yourself. You're not available to participate in this process. So if, and this is the un, completely unlike the way the world works, the way the nations work, the way the profane peoples of the earth work. They want vengeance. They want people to get what's coming to them. They want to see them suffer. They want, this is what they call social justice. They want people to suffer for something that has been done. Well, the kingdom of heaven says if that's where you are, you are excused for this day's lesson. You have no point, you have no place in the community. You're riding the sur you're surfing, you're surfing the emotion tide. You're not flowing in the holiness of God. You can't. The anger of man cannot do the righteousness of God. So therefore, let's look at what you do want to do. There's two things. If we don't follow the rule of retribution or the rule of vengeance, then what do we follow? We follow the rule of compensation, restitution. What is necessary to, as much as possible in the human realm, fix this? How can we set a foundation on which this situation and the bloodlines that are affected can move forward from here? That's not restitution. I mean, it's not retribution. That is not vengeance. The issue is how can we move on from here in a positive, productive way? How can we make something good come forth out of this tragic event of violent attack or angry attack at one another? How can we get over the kalaling, get over the, the uh, nakabing, get over the physical violence that took place and the trauma that took place? It is not going to be by being angry about it or being upset about it or inflicting wounds upon other people for it. It's going to be instead about finding ways to go on, move on from here. Now, here's the situation. Torah tells us that this man... The, the blasphemer was the son of Shalomit of the tribe of Dan. 
you do realize, I hope, that whatever happens is not just about this man. It's about Shalomit. It's about his mother. It's about his family. It's about his tribe. It's about his clan. It involves so many more people than just the blasphemer himself. Every time you make a judgment that somebody needs to die or somebody needs to be punished or somebody needs to be put in prison, every time you, on the basis of something you heard on social media or the news media, decide this ought to happen to that person, you forget one important thing. This is not just about him or her. Lock her up. Lock him up. This is not about that. This is about a bloodline and about the restoration of humanity, the redemption of humanity as a species, bloodline by bloodline, and the restoration of creation to its original intended state of beauty and fruitfulness and shalom and retribution and what they deserve has got nothing to do with that. Zilt, zero minus five. Instead, we've got to figure out a way to move on. We've got to figure out a way to heal. And so compensation is the methodology we use. But the more important thing is, how can we honor God? Not kalal him, not nakab him, not, not take away his honor. That he's, how can we bring the honor and the glory and the majesty of God into this situation? How do you think? <laughs> that doesn't mean the event, the act wasn't horrendous doesn't mean it, it, it shouldn't have happened. doesn't mean the person didn't get caught up in their emotion tide or their, or their pseudo-intellect or their flesh. Or, or their, or, it doesn't mean they weren't a great person. But the issue is, how can we bring honor and glory to God, to our Creator and His plan in the midst of this horrid? How can we transcend? How can we overcome? How can we bring about life as opposed to to death how do we balance these factors for the good of the creation the good of the world versus our desire to see vengeance and retribution and punishment meted out there are times when we have to remove people from our lives we have to move people from our nate we have to remove people from this life but that's not something we do on the basis of emotion that's not something we do on the basis of they deserve it that's something we do because the creation calls for it, demands it. It has to happen in order for the plan of God to go forward. That this is too toxic. This is too much cancer to allow in our lives. This has to be cut out. And then the only one's going to give us guidelines to know when to do that and when not to do that. Now, how do you bring the highest level of kadusha, the highest level of glory into everything, into every situation, no matter how damaging or dark it is? What are, you know... To blaspheme is to take out his essence, to cut him, to, to disembowel him, to take away the essence of mercy, the essence of forgiveness, the essence of covenant faithfulness, the essence of love. Now, to honor him is to put those things back in. This is why forgiveness is the most powerful tool we have. <laughs> it's never about who's right and who's wrong and who deserves forgiveness, who doesn't forgive. Nobody deserves forgiveness. forgiveness that's the whole idea. It's undeserved. It's not, we don't do it because we feel better because we did it. I mean, I know that's what psychologists tell you today. And some preachers tell you that today. But you, if you're doing it for that reason, then you're a very selfish person. You do it for one reason and one reason only because the creator of the universe calls for you to do it. And not only has he called you to do it, he said, this is how you will demonstrate who I am. This is my way of revealing my, of and more myself into this world, bringing holiness to this world. Well, this is our lesson for the day. I hope you've had a good time with us as you visited with us these last few minutes. Blessings to all of you across the world. May you drop us a line, a little note, a prayer request, a comment, a question, anything you wish to let us know you were here. I will go through it, and many others in our group will also probably go through it and pray over uh, each one of you and each one of your, your nations and your people. Blessings to you. Shabbat shalom. Amen.